I want to welcome you all. Uh, we are delighted that so many uh, have registered for this third and final of our summer conversations at the Liberal Jewish Synagogue. The first of our conversation conversations featured um, a discussion on psychological perspectives on identity. In the second, the baritone and cellist Simon Wolfish spoke about music and survival. And tonight, another treat is in store. Two remarkable and highly talented individuals will cover a wide range of topics that take in Hollywood, the Rolling Stones, Nazi Germany, music, and much more. Film producer Sandy Lieberson and filmmaker Ursula McFarlane will be in conversation over the next 45 minutes to an hour. Before introducing them more fully, I ask you to remain muted. And if you have any questions, which we'll be glad to pick up towards the end of the evening, please write them in the chat box and I will try to get to as many of them as possible and include them as we move towards the end of the evening and present them to our guests. Please forgive me if I don't pick up all your questions. So <clears throat> now let me introduce our guests for this evening. Sandy Lieberson. Sandy was born and grew up in Los Angeles. His parents were both immigrants from the Ukraine. Sandy's grandparents on both sides sent their children to the USA, but remained in Ukraine and were either killed in pogroms or during the World, World War II. He moved to Rome in 1962 to work as an agent representing both European and American actors, writers and directors, and returned to the USA in 1964 for one year before moving to London in 1965 for what was meant to be just one year, but marriage and children then kept him here for over 50 years. He has returned to the USA for work on various films and then as president of 20th Century Fox. Sandy and his wife, Sarah, have been members of the LGS for over 10 years. He's the father of five children, Lucy, Ben, Holly, Jesse, who sadly passed away, and Grace, who had her bat mitzvah at the LJS. Ursula McFarlane was born in London, spent her childhood in Buckinghamshire, and moved back to London after university. She joined the LJS 26 years ago with her husband, Roy Ackerman, the documentary producer, when they had their first child, Joe. Joe and his brother, Leo, had their bar mitzvahs at the LJS. Ursula says she is not Jewish, but was delighted to be welcomed into the LJS. She said, I found it an incredibly welcoming place and its inspirational combination of spirituality and liberal values has been a great comfort to me over the years. She's learned a lot about Judaism and Jewish cultural life through the synagogue and Roy's very welcoming family and was moved to be able to take her first trip to Auschwitz as a result of making a documentary film, more about that anon. Also through that film, she had the real pleasure of meeting Anita Lasker Wolfish, the grandmother of Simon, who did such a captivating conversation session last week. Her latest film is Untouchable, a theatrical feature documentary about the rise and fall of Harvey Weinstein, which premiered in 2019. I want to kick off this evening, but leave the rest to you, Sandy and Ursula, by saying that you have both, in different eras, made films about Nazi Germany. Uh, Swastika in 1972, Sandy, and Warwick Davis and the Seven Dwarves of Auschwitz by you, Ursula. Tell us a little bit about those films and what inspired you to make them and what their reception was like. Do you want to start first, Sandy? Yeah, um, yeah the reception to Swastika. 
Um, well, swastika came out of um, optioning the book Inside the Third Reich by Albert Speer. Um, and we had developed a screenplay. Uh, we had a deal in Hollywood uh, to make the film for Paramount. Uh, we could never agree with Paramount ultimately over the screenplay or the director that they wanted. Um, and so we withdrew from the agreement and we ultimately lost our option on the book. We weren't able to make it. But by that point, um, I was so committed to doing something um, about Nazi Germany. Um, and it came out of, of a real quest to try and understand the mentality of Germany during that period. Uh, how the most cultured intellectual, uh, one of the most cultured intellectual countries in the world, full of Jews, how could this have happened? What was the mentality behind this? What motivated people to want to participate in this kind of a government and this kind of a society? So being unable to do Inside the Third Reich, I thought let's do a documentary uh, instead. And um, I struck up a relationship with the director, Philippe Mora, and the documentary maker and researcher, Lutz Becker. And we decided to work together, the three of us, to do two films called The Nazification of Germany. And the first one was Double-Headed Eagle um, that Lutz Becker directed. And the second was Swastika that Philippe Mora directed. Um, we were able to make the film. Uh, because of the resources we had. And uh, when we completed the movie, um, we were invited to participate in the Cannes Film Festival in 1972. And we went to the festival, excited. <laughs> Feature documentary was at that point in Cannes was a rarity. I think there only been one or two before us. So we were so excited about it. And normally what you do when you get invited to Cannes, you poster the town. You put up posters announcing your film, when it's going to be shown. Ours was shown in the Palais at 8 o'clock. Um, and we must have put up about 100 posters. And something strange happened. The posters all got torn down. Um, and it, we couldn't understand what was going on. We thought somebody, some individual had organized you know, to, to remove them or whatever. Um, it came for the evening of the screening. It, it all started and then descended into a disaster. Within half an hour, the audience uh, were yelling, uh, screaming, stop this film. This is a tribute to Adolf Hitler, et cetera, et cetera. And the movie um, was stopped. They tried to start it again. The audience refused to leave and refused to allow it to be shown. Uh, and that was the reception for Swastika. Obviously, what we did was we completely misunderstood the audience, the public, how um, sophisticated they were about uh, our film. And it was a terrible mistake because an audience wasn't ready to see Hitler, first of all, in color for the first time. Um, and secondly, a film without a narration, which meant there was nobody telling you who to hate or who to like or who to blame. And so um, it was a complete disaster. Yeah, um, that was the reception. That was the beginning. So, Sandy, um, I actually only saw the film for the first time about three days ago. And if people here haven't seen it, I would urge you to watch it because, you know, at this point I have seen many films about the Nazis, about Hitler, about Nazi Germany, but it's a very, um, I can only really describe it as a visceral experience. Um, I find it hard to believe that audiences felt that it was sympathetic to Adolf Hitler, but it creeps up on you, this film. So, Quite near the beginning, you see the Hitler youth boys and girls and it's sort of bucolic country walks and they're all lovely dressed in lovely uniforms. And then sort of maybe half an hour later or so, you see the young men beating the 
hell out of each other in sort of, you know, training, fight training. And it's so disturbing. Um, and then this is all intercut with uh, Hitler and his cohort um, and this incredible footage, which I want to ask you about, up in his mountain retreat in Obersalzburg. Um, I think now we've seen a lot of that archive in other films, but Sandy, at the time, where did, how did you get hold of it? Because to me, that was, there's a lot of things I hadn't seen there. I mean, Ava Brown, for example, turning cartwheels and swimming down by the lake and Hitler patting his, his dog, his favorite dog, Blondie, who he later killed. Um, where did you get that archive from? I mean, it's extraordinary and it's in color. Well, when the United States troops um, uh, captured or took over, over Salzburg, they took everything that was there, every single item that was there, including the color home movies of Adolf Hitler and Abel Braun. And they brought them back to Washington, to the United States. Uh, the film, I don't know how it was um, hidden, but it was wound inside some other material so that if you would pick up and look at the first minute or two of the movie, you would see black and white newsreel. If you unwound the entire reel, then you would discover that there are the color home movies in amongst that black and white material. So Lutz Becker, who was an incredible uh, archivist and uh, researcher, uh, went to uh, Washington as part of our research for swastika. Um, and discovered this, he'd heard rumors about home movies and color home movies, but nobody had actually got their hands on them. Uh, and he tried to track the rumors down and that led him to the National Archives in Washington. And through sheer luck, looking through all of the black and white material, he discovered the color home movies. Um, and it became a bit of a, a problem because the, the German company, appointed by the government called Transit Films, became the owner of all Nazi film, documentary material, et cetera. Uh, and they tried to stop us using the material in our film. And uh, we said, sorry, we're gonna use it whether you give us permission or not. It's, you know, for our point of view, it's, you don't own the copyright. So um, there was that hurdle to get over. And then of course, it was a long search for all kinds of material, yeah. Uh, should we look at the uh, trailer that we've got um, before? It's an incredible film and it's um, it's on Amazon Prime, I think, if any of you've got Amazon Prime, it's 
free, I think, or not very much money, and it's 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 incredible. Um, shall we talk about the dwarfs? Yeah, I mean, just just to put it in context, the concept, our concept behind making the movie, you see the swastika in space, and that was the idea that we were dropped into Germany from you know some other planet I had no idea who Adolf Hitler was or what Nazi Germany was um, and so it's a voyage of discovery for some alien person who finds themselves in Germany and that was the idea behind the movie. And it's brilliant because you see Germany from space and and gradually you get closer and closer and you come down and you come down and you come down. And at the beginning, I had no idea what it was. I realized by the end, <laughs> when, you when you repeat the same shot, um, go back the other way. And it's, it's, yeah, very, very powerful. And I think if you were an alien, you know, you would get great insight from that film. <laughs> Maybe not the kind of insight you wanted. It's, uh, it, is, it is an absolutely brilliant film. Ursula, can you talk about your film that you made with Warwick Davis? A very sort of different take yeah. on the Holocaust, but equally powerful and very, very moving, actually. Yeah, no, sure. So I got to meet Warwick Davis, um, who I'm sure a lot of you know. know. He's, a, he's a dwarf. Uh, and he is in Harry Potter. I think he's in all of the Harry Potter films as Professor Flitwick. That's how most children definitely know him. And um, he's, anyway, he's made films for years and he's an incredibly um, wonderful, interesting person um, with a, a, a fantastic family. And he had always, um, he'd always been interested in other dwarfs through history and to find out sort of what, you know, how they were treated by society and, because they were treated very badly and there was a lot of prejudice against them and probably still is. And he knew about this family of dwarfs um, called the Ovitzes, and they lived in a tiny village in Romania near sort of up in Transylvania. And they were very, very famous in the thirties and forties. And they used to, they were like a traveling troupe and they would go around Europe and they had a Rolls Royce and they wore furs and they were very, actually very, very, successful um, but you know when when obviously the war came they were very vulnerable not just because they were Jewish they were Jewish but also because they were dwarfs and seen as uh, you know strange people or disabled people and so they were taken to a ghetto in Romania and then from there onwards to Auschwitz and I think for Warwick um, you know, again, he's not Jewish, but it was a very, you know, it was something he wanted to experience for himself. So in England, he met lots of people who, you know, he went to the Holocaust Library and he met lots of people who could give him sort of historical information, but he, he wanted to go there himself. So, so maybe we should show the trailer, actually, because it's a bit of the film where he's come to Romania, he's gone to the village where you know, this is a long time ago, there are not many people left alive who remember the dwarfs, but he did, he did meet the, the, the former mayor of the village who, who told him what he remembered about the dwarfs when he was a little boy. Um, but this bit of the film, anyway, he's arrived at the train station from which they are going to head off on the train, on, in, you know, in the cattle trucks off to Auschwitz. <laughs> So finally we arrived here, as the Obitzes did. I mean, this place looks like it probably did in the 1940s. Definitely, yes. Mm. But the Obitzes weren't a cattle wagon. I mean, that's impossible. That's impossible. impossible. I wouldn't know even where to start. Just even to get on this, and this is meant for passengers to get on, but a cattle truck mm -hmm. isn't even designed with steps. And the, and the cattle truck is like that. Mm. There are no steps for it. I mean, I'm not getting in there. Whatever happens. Don't try. Alino, the young Richard. There were 
40 cattle trucks. Each with 80 people crammed inside. The Ovitzes thought they were going to be rehoused, so they'd brought the tools of their trade makeup, costumes, instruments. I wonder what did they talk about on the train? Did they discuss? What's going to happen? Where we're going to end up working? Do you think they discussed a strategy? You know, what were their thoughts? a beautiful film if I can just say Asila very moving the the youngest I think of the Ovitz siblings who died only a few years ago in Israel um, yeah, I, 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 yeah go sorry. on no, I was just going to say I should have um, I should have um, explained actually so that you would know exactly who that wonderful lady is She's called Perla Ovitz, and she was, yes, the youngest of the siblings. She actually died the day before 9-11. And, you know, people always said it was, you know, she was quite elderly at that point. And people always said that, you know, they felt relieved in a way that she didn't have to live through that, having herself lived through such, such trauma. Anyway, she was filmed by somebody, fortunately for us. It was, uh, again, like as Sandy was saying, you know, sometimes films have these, this kind of serendipity and it's almost like a gift that you get for the film and there she was and she was a very you know very sort of vivacious lady and we didn't do that interview that was an interview obviously that had done had been done some years before just before she died so we were I mean that was such a you know a wonderful thing that we could have in the film and mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah just just I mean going to Auschwitz I think Warwick was pretty devastated by it. Um, you know, as I said, he's not Jewish, but he is a dwarf. And I think he realized by going there that had he been alive at that point, he and his family who are also all dwarfs um, and in Germany, you know, their story would have been very different. And he was incredibly moved and it was, um, it was a really difficult day. And I felt a bit guilty afterwards because I, I made him walk around a lot to, to, you know, to film it, to get the shots we needed. And he didn't really have the right shoes on and, and he was freezing cold. But, you know, one of the things about Warwick Davis is that he is what he calls the spirit of a dwarf. And it, it is this amazing spirit that despite constant pain in his case and many dwarfs cases with their spine and their joints, you know, he, he, he's an absolute trooper. And just going back to the Ovitzes, what we discovered speaking with historians is they had that spirit of a dwarf as well. And, um, you know, they were, as you can imagine, embraced by Mengele, who wanted to do experiments on them. And, um, you know, they survived all the horrible things that he did and they made it out. You know, they were there. They fortunately, in a way, they came there quite late. So they were liberated when when the Red Army came in. 
And actually, I think it took them a year to get back to Romania, but I think I'm right in saying they're one of the few families, the whole family made it out, um, all of them. And then after that, they were offered to go to America and continue performing, but they, they felt they, I think just being so little, they felt vulnerable about going to somewhere as kind of huge and sort of, you know, sophisticated as New York. So in the end, they decided to go to Israel and I think they had a very good life there. And funnily enough, they opened up a chain of cinemas. So, um, um, as you know, I just, um, I want us to move on to music because you've both yeah. made films about music, but I can't um, evade a, uh, a question from Roy Ackerman, your husband, who says, some people say you have to be Jewish to make films about Jewish subjects. You clearly found a way of making an epithetic film about the Holocaust, but a lot of people are now saying that the big Black Lives Matter stories should be told by black filmmakers. What do you think of the whole issue of who can and should tell stories? Well, it's, it's a tricky question. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> um, I think, I think it's really complicated. I mean, I think given the absolute uproar and uprising and absolutely legitimate um, outpouring of rage and desire for change that we've had, I absolutely agree in that case. And I was offered to do a film about George Floyd recently and said to the producer, I must not, you know, you, a black filmmaker should make this film. This is not my story. Um, is this different? I don't know. It's something to talk about for a long time. You know, it's something to discuss perhaps in a, you know, in a very profound and probably it would take a, a very long time. You know, Warwick isn't Jewish. I don't, you know, I, I you know, that there's a kind of argument that only women should make films about sensitive subjects like abortion, for example, which I've made a film about. But I don't really buy that because I think you know, lots of human beings and many filmmakers are very sensitive and I think that they can bring things out that, you know, if a man makes a film about a so-called female subject like that, um, the question might be, would a woman have more empathy with the contributors? Would she get more out of them by being a woman? And that's that's also, also debatable. Um, but in general, I think, you know, we, we have the right to make films about the subjects that we care about. And I felt, um, and perhaps also because, you know, I do have a Jew, Jewish family background. I felt that, you know, I was very motivated to make this film because I had never been to Auschwitz. So going, going to Auschwitz was, you know, an extraordinary experience for me. So all I can say is that I am very glad that I went and I hope I did it some justice. Um, but I think this conversation goes on. And... Sandy, do you have a view on that, sort of briefly, because we, then we're going to move on to music. Well, in real life, I am colorblind. Um, so that carries over into my social life as well. I've always had black friends. Uh, I've always felt comfortable, sometimes more comfortable with um, Afro-American friends. Um, and um, my first experience with the, what you're posing as a question was over Malcolm X and Norman Jewison um, had prepared the script and was going to direct the film. And he got tremendous pressure from Spike Lee and from a number of other uh, members, black members of the film industry. And he turned the film over to Spike Lee he decided it would better, be better from his own perspective um, to allow a black filmmaker to make that film about Malcolm X. So it has happened before and it's happening now where the pendulum swings, it swings all the way the other way. Um, and at some point in the future, maybe there will be some balance, but I don't buy into only men can make certain kinds of films and only women can make, and black filmers can, from can do this or that. No, I, 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 as I say, I'm one who responds to talent and wherever color it may be or race, that's what I'm gonna go for. Can, can I pick up then that word talent um, to talk about 
the films that you've made about music, um, Notes from the Inside, Ursula. Can you talk to us a little bit about that film? I think there's a clip as well when you're ready. Yeah, so that was a film. Um, I mean, I, I am a huge music lover. It's a massively important part of my life. And um, I met this, uh, um, this um, concert pianist called James Rhodes. I'd actually done a series with him for Sky Arts. And he had been sectioned not that long before we make, made the film. He was very unwell. He had been diagnosed with different kinds of mental illnesses um, and been in section for his own safety. Um, he wanted to talk about the fact that he had been abused for many years when he was a young child and that these things had led him towards severe mental illness. Um, anyway, he, he used to play the piano when he was a kid and he completely gave it up. And he didn't touch the piano for years. And then he ended up being sectioned. And a friend of his wanted to visit him and he was horrified to find out that in this particular ward, they weren't allowed any kind of stimuli. So there was no music, no books, no television, nothing. And he was horrified. So he knew that James loved Bach and he got a little, he got a big tube of toothpaste and he hollowed it out and he snuck in a, an iPod Nano at the time that he'd filled up with Bach, Glenn Gould playing Bach. And James managed to get hold of some headphones, God knows how. And he sat in the garden and he said, he said, you know, I'm not religious, but when I heard that music, it was just like, you know, everything. I knew that everything was going to be all right. And I think it really was that much of an epiphany for him. Um, anyway, I know we've, you know, we want to talk about Sandy's work as well. So just very quickly, the film that we made was him going back to hospital meeting some patients who also had been very ill were sort of, you know, on at a stage where they were looking to um, to leave fairly soon and sort of a halfway house. And he played music, he, he selected music for I think four or five of them and played that music to them. And yeah, it was very affecting. So the clip that we've got is um, he had chosen a piece for a woman called Chrissy, who like him had a young son that she hadn't been able to see because she was very ill. And James had the same story because of his illness. He had not been able to see his little boy. And I think they really connected on that. So this is um, this is a clip where he plays for her. And Igor, you don't need to, send it to play the whole thing because I think it's about six minutes. So maybe just a couple of minutes. Hello. Oh, it's so good to see you, Chrissy. Oh, gosh. It seems like forever. I know. Hello, darling. You all right? I'm very well. How are you? And I was thinking, really thinking what to play. And the one thing you and I both have in common is we both have a child. And we've both been absent to some extent. Yeah. Which for me is really is still, it's a big thing. and. There was a composer called Gluck, and he wrote this opera called Orfeo and Eurydice, which is just this tragic love story. And even though it's kind of intense, maybe, and sad, there is this kind of running through it, this idea that actually, you know what, everything's okay. Which, you know, in music for me is so powerful because it goes beneath words. And so I, I thought of this and I thought, maybe think about it rather than boy meets girl, parent and child and that kind of relationship um, and you know see what you think and hopefully it, it will kind of resonate with you in a small way or a big way or, or in no way at all but we shall see and you've only just learnt this piece I learnt it a couple of weeks ago <gasps> Yeah. Really? And you don't need any music to... Well, we'll soon find out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs>
should ask Sandy about his music films because you've... Um... Well, can I move on a bit to Sandy? Your, can I jump in here to your film performance, the 1970 crime drama film, um, which stars James Fox as a violent and ambitious London gangster who, after killing an old friend, goes into hiding at the home of a reclusive rock star, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. Um, could I ask you about that, Sandy? Um, I can. And perhaps we'll no, watch this bit of trailer. Are you playing the trailer or are you waiting for me to We respond? can play the trailer first if you like. Okay. Warner Brothers presents performance with Mick Jagger and Mick Jagger. James Fox and James Fox. Morning, mate. This is a film about madness. No soap on the gentleman's collar. Madness yeah. and sanity. A film about fantasy. How much did you give him? Two thirds of the big one. Mm, that's insane. The old man was called in the language of Persia. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm normal. <laughs> right, again. Me. Me. Would you call that equitable? San Antonio on a hot and dusty night. You're a baggy little leather boy with a smaller piece of stick. We were lashing, smashing hunk of man. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Come now, gentlemen, your love is all I crave. You'll still be in the circus when I'm laughing. and reality and sensuality. A film about death. And life. This is a film about vice. And versa. Sandy, how was this film received at the time? Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Warner Brothers didn't want to release the movie. They were the distributors and they put up the money to make the film. Um, they were, I, I mean, they read the screenplay and they had discussions briefly with the two directors and myself, but uh, they still in their mind, for some reason, thought they were gonna get Hard Day's Night or um, you know, something like that as a pop film. Um, and when they saw the film, they hated it. They, um, they shut the film down just before it was due to be completed and, cajoled them to at least finish the film, finished it. Um, and um, we had a preview in Hollywood, which was a complete disaster. Once again, the audience demanded their money back. Uh, and the Warner Brothers executives freaked out and they said, we're not releasing the film. It's an X-rated movie. We don't release X-rated films. Uh, they have the um, 
psychiatrist who works for the motion picture companies there. And he said, no, this is not suitable for Warners to distribute. So um, it was shut down and I thought, um, well, <laughs> this is what it's like to be a producer. Uh, and uh, it took uh, over a year. There was a change in management at Warner Brothers. And one of the executives who came in was a man called Fred Weintraub, New Yorker, who had a very successful nightclub uh, and uh, management of musicians. This club was called The Bottom Line. And um, he was also the guy who was the exec producer of Woodstock. And so he said, no, performance, we've got a good movie here. Let's release it. So almost two years after we'd finished the film, it finally got a release. Um, and it was the critics were split on it. Some thought it was wonderful. The majority of them thought it was terrible. Some of them said it was the worst film they'd ever seen. Um, and so um, it's not always an easy ride as a producer. But um, the origins of performance were I represented the writer, Donald Campbell, um, who had written a film that a client of mine, James Coburn, uh, starred in, in in London called Duffy. I really liked the writing of the screenplay. I liked um, Donald Campbell as a writer. And he came to me with this idea called, it was called Performers originally. And um, I loved the idea, the concept of what he wanted to make. And so he was a friend of Nicholas Rogue and approached Nick Rogue. We all met, we talked about the fact that um, this was a, a film uh, that would be different, unusual and challenging. And at that point, I thought, well, you know, I've never wanted to be a producer, but I love this idea. I like the fact working with Donald Campbell and Nicholas Rogue. So that was the reason I decided to produce it. It wasn't that I wanted to become a producer. It was a particular group of people that I wanted to work with on this particular subject. And so that was it. That was the beginning and almost the end. How did it, um, so that was your first producing gig, having been an agent, and you said it was a kind of harsh introduction. How did that, you know, it's, it's about debauchery, I guess, that film, isn't it? And it's um, maybe it was swinging London at the time. And, you know, was that, was it something you'd come from Los Angeles? Was there something very British or very London about that film? I mean, could it have been made somewhere else? Or was it part of that 60s, feel of being in London at that uh, it, moment. It had to be a British film. It had to be a London film. And it had to be made with Mick Jagger and Anita Palmberg. Otherwise, there's no purpose in making it. Um, at least I didn't think there was. So um, I, it, it's, yeah, something that felt of its time. And that was the idea. I think if you want to know what I thought the film was about, it was a bit of debauchery in it. Um, but for me, it was about identity. It was people actually being able to um, identify who they were and what they wanted to be and what they wanted to do. So um, that was the motivating factor, this voyage of discovery for all four uh, of the main characters. Um, and it, I think, was representative of what was going on in London at the time. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll in 1968. Um, they say if you could remember it, you weren't there. But uh, it, it, so it's of its time. Um, we couldn't have made it any place else or any way different than it was made. And, I mean, Ursula, you've made your the film about the fall of Harvey Weinstein in in many ways also a film of, of our own time. Is there time to see a clip of of that as well and just have a quick chat about that? I think there's an sure. Do you, do you want to play the clip and then we can have a quick chat, Igor? It's again it's a trailer. Thank <laughs> you. 
I always imagine, like plenty of people in this industry, that actresses slept with Harvey because it was good for their career. I went with no plan, no agent, very little money. Here was I meeting one of the most powerful men in Hollywood. I was going to have dinner with him at the Beverly Hills Hotel. He said, can we have a drink upstairs at yours? So obviously this is the part that's very hard to talk about. Harvey Weinstein was known to be a bully. He could do anything. He thought of himself as the sheriff in town. He scared people in the same way a gangster would. When you read about rape, you read she kicks and screams. I just froze. I said no and I pushed him away more than once. And then I just stopped. collateral damage, what it does to relationships, it steals something. When I tried to tell people, they say, you better keep your mouth shut. Well, I saw a lot about how the machine works in terms of burying scandals and settlements. Nobody was ever going to win against this guy. I was hearing stories which you could dismiss as rumor. I was being told these women are crazy. You have to do something. Why is the day you touch my priest? Please, I'm sorry, just come on, I'm used to that. Huge turning point. I couldn't believe that they were telling the story as though they were writing about me. Mr. Weinstein intends to enter a plea of not guilty. The most sinister aspect is that the system enabled it. Power, everybody's getting a piece of it. When you pick out the most grotesque, there's the sense that, okay, we've taken care of the problem. It's not over. It continues. Yeah, I suppose it's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, Sandy, you're talking about a film, you know, an incredible film you made that was of its time, and I guess this film is of its time. Um, we made that, we finished making that film before Harvey got, uh, before his trial and his subsequent conviction. So he is now a convicted um, sex abuser and rapist. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, talking about Hollywood, I think it's interesting that he, Weinstein styled himself on the old kind of moguls of Hollywood. You know, he wanted to be Louis B. Meyer and he talked about that a lot. You know, and as we know in those days, and I think for a long time, the casting couch was a thing, very much a thing. And many people saw it as completely transactional that the women knew what they were getting into and they wanted it in order to get the roles. And I think what his story showed is, is the, the lie behind that. And that, you know, there may have been, and I think there were some people who willingly did this, um, but I think the majority and certainly all the women in our film um, just wanted to work and they were young and they thought, you know, that Harvey could um, help their career, which he did in many cases. Um, and so they went to those meetings, but they didn't go to those meetings to be attacked and abused. So I think, you know, I hope and I think it is a big, I think the Weinstein story is a, a huge paradigm shift. I don't think things can be the same anymore, particularly since he went to jail. I think if he hadn't gone to jail, that would have been quite a different story. But, you know, there are many people now um, who are sort of coming out of the woodwork, so to speak, and being um, accused. And, you know, and women as well have been accused, um, Ghislaine Maxwell now, of kind of aiding and abetting. And so I think, you know, I, I was proud to make that film and get those voices out there. And, you know, these women finally, after you know, there's a woman in the trailer that you just saw who had not spoken about this ever for 40 years until she did this interview. And that was, you know, very moving thing to experience and to be part of. And so, yeah, I know, I mean, Sandy, how much do you think Hollywood has really changed? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that one of the many things that I love about your documentaries is the sensitivity to the characters that you are 
investigating or portraying or um, making a film about. And, and that um, is an incredible quality. So um, hats off to you, really. You. Not just for this film, but generally uh, for in all your films, the ones that I've seen. Um, as far as Harvey Weinstein goes, well, um, number one, Hollywood uh, is run on fear. Um, if there's one feeling that's pervasive in Hollywood, it's fear. It's fear of not being a success, a fear of not being liked, uh, a fear of not getting your movie made, a fear of being a failure, a fear of losing your job. Fear permeates everything. Yeah, people look happy and they're enjoying themselves and going to the right restaurants, and, but when they get home, they're frightened. Um, and with the Weinstein, uh, um, before he was convicted, before he even went on trial, the fear running through Hollywood, and when I say Hollywood, I mean the industry, whether it's TV commercials or television or film or streaming platforms, the fear running through the industry was palpable. You could feel that. People were terrified that they were going to be called out. Uh, they had done the same thing that Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein is a bigger bully and a louder and, and more violent, but nonetheless, this was the feeling of the industry, fear that they were going to be caught out. So um, it's not just the conviction of Harvey Weinstein, but people don't want to lose their jobs. People want to continue making films. Um, and so they've had to change, not willingly. Uh, a lot of them resent it, um, but nonetheless, they've had to buy into this sea change of um, equality. And, and of course, now it's also encompassing uh, Black Americans as well. And um, it's, it's an, an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, Harvey Weinstein represented what the tradition was in Hollywood. There is a transaction between uh, actresses and uh, executives and producers and directors and writers. Um, and um, it was understood, hey, I'm gonna go to bed with you. I'm gonna fuck you, uh, but I want that role. Um, so this sea change is really a sea change. It's a, quite uh, unnerving for a lot of people and the business. And a lot of people have lost their jobs um, by accusations and then I'm assuming they're true accusations, but one never knows, they're never gone to court. Andy, we can't, and as uh, so you're coming to the end of, of this, but um, there is a question in the chat from Eric Sennett. Um, there's a question for you, Sandy, that says after a long career, who are the great filmmakers in your career. Um, I, I'd want to add a little rider to that to say, has this great sea change changed your view in some ways of who the great filmmakers are? Um, but no. I don't want to I, no, I, it, it, it Eric's doesn't question. Because um, what I've got to do is look at it. Um, what can I do about Lenny Riefenstahl? I can look at her movies and think, wow, that's a, an incredibly talented filmmaker, extraordinary filmmaker. Uh, she was uh, a confidant of Hitler's and part of the Nazi um, movement, et cetera. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm curious to watch her films to see how she expresses herself. And um, uh, so I'm not, you know, I've had one experience just in the past couple of months. Um, somebody said, you know, we're going to screen, um, sorry, it was in uh, February, we're going to screen the new Roman Polanski film, Jacques And I thought, oh, that'd be interesting. I'm really interested in seeing it. It was a big success in France and won Cesars. And then all of a sudden it went quiet. And I called the guy and I said, well, when is the screening? He said, sorry, we can't screen it because um, we can't, none of the distributors will touch it. Um, nobody wants to, you know, be involved with the screening, etc. So, I, you know, people's careers are ruined and changed and it's because of maybe their past actions or the way things are nowadays. 
Ursula, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I've, I find it I find it really difficult, I have to say, because, you know, if you think of one example for me, Michael Jackson, who, uh, you know, we now know has been accused of, of terrible paedophilia. And, you know, if some people don't believe it. I do. Um, I know the guy who made the recent film and, you know, I absolutely do believe it. But at the same time, I really, really love the music of Michael Jackson. You know, it's informed my youth and I love dancing to Michael Jackson. So if you said to me, well, you should never listen to a Michael Jackson track again, I would be really devastated. And then, you know, people have often said to me, well, could you watch a Harvey Weinstein film? And I say, of course you could, because, you know, he's not the artist. He wasn't the writer. He wasn't the director. You know, he's not the leader. He put the package together. It's not, not the same thing. Could I watch a Woody Allen, a Woody Allen film? And it's really difficult because, you know, one of my favorite films is Manhattan, but he's having an affair with a schoolgirl. So I don't know what the answer is really. Um, I'm just very glad that these things are coming out and that people are being exposed. Um, and I think there is another side to it where people are being falsely accused, but I would say just from the people that I've met that that would be a tiny minority uh, of false accusations. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's something I think we should all be discussing and thinking, looking at our own conscious consciences. But, you know, if you literally took out every artist that has ever done anything wrong, there probably would not be many artists left because, you know, a lot of artists have demons and they're not very nice necessarily. You know, those demons are dark and do terrible things. But if we were to sort of be able to understand more about those demons by watching their work, then I think that's justifiable. You know, D.H. Lawrence, I mean, you just, you know, the list is absolutely endless but it's still uncomfortable. So I don't know what the answer is, you know, because I will keep listening to Michael Jackson. You, you've taken both of us. I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful evening this has been. Unfortunately, really unfortunately, we've come to the very end of our evening, of our time slot this evening and our summer conversations. And I couldn't think of a better way in which to end those conversations by being in the presence, if I can put it like that, of you, Sandy, and you, Ursula, feel immensely privileged. I know I speak for all of us here of having seen the clips of your films and some, some, some full of some of those full films as well, and um, and hearing you talk about them, and now hearing you talk in a sense about art and morality. You know, people like Wagner, for example, it's an endless open ended question, really. And I think both of you have um, opened up to that question so honestly and with such integrity. I wanted to say thank you so much. We are indebted to two really great artists, thoughtful, intelligent, who've shared with us their sort of life's experience. And um, we could listen to you for a lot longer and there's lots of appreciations in the chat. So please do have a look at that. Thank you to everybody who's here today, um, who's been with us and um, yeah, do put your hands together to express your appreciation to Sandy and to Ursula and a big thank you as well to Sue Balsam there. Thank you.